Hello everybody. I hope you are doing well and enjoying this course. I'm back with part 5 of Laplace transform and this is basically the last session that we entirely talk about Laplace transform. So in the next lecture we will move on to a new topic but we will still use Laplace transform as a tool. Let me give you a review of the previous session which was a synchronous session. The previous session, we summarized the solution of ODEs using Laplace transform technique. And this flowchart simplifies the procedure that we followed in a very nice way. We start with an ODE and depending on the order of the ODE, we need to have some initial conditions. For example, if it's a first order ODE, we need to know the value of the function at time zero. And if it's a second order ODE, in addition to the value of the function, we need to also know the value of its derivative at time zero and so on and so forth. And so far we are in the time domain, but then as soon as we take the Laplace transform of the ODE, we move everything to our Laplace domain or frequency domain, and that's why I use this blue rectangle in here. So anything within this rectangle is in Laplace domain. Then effectively by taking Laplace transform of the equation, we convert the ODE into an algebraic equation, which can be simply solved to gives us capital YS, which is the solution of our ODE, but in Laplace domain in terms of a rational function which is capital N of S divided by capital D of S. And if you're lucky and the problem is easy, we can right away find a match for this rational function in our Laplace transform table and take the inverse Laplace transform of this rational function to obtain the solution of our ODE but this time in the time domain. But if this uh, rational function is not simple and we cannot immediately find a match so that we can take the inverse Laplace transform of this function, we have to take one extra step and that is to break this down into its elementary building blocks by factoring ds and then using partial fraction expansion or decomposition and then take the inverse Laplace transform of the outcome. In this session, I will just give you a few more properties of Laplace transform. The first property is called final value theorem. And what it says is basically, if we have a function capital Y of S, which is a Laplace transform of a little y of T, and if we want to know the value of little y as time approaches infinity, we really don't need to take the inverse Laplace transform of capital Y S to figure out what exactly Y T is and then calculate the limit. We can use this property of Laplace transform, which says the limit of Y T as T approaches infinity is equal to the limit of capital S times capital Y of S as S approaches zero. In the same manner, we have the initial value theorem that says the value of little y t as t approaches zero is equal to the limit of S capital Y S as S approaches infinity. To help you understand this better, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say we know that the Laplace transform of a function is capital Y of S, which is 5S plus 2 over S times 5S plus 4. And we want to know what is the value of the little y t, which is the inverse Laplace transform of this function, as t approaches infinity. But we don't want to take the inverse Laplace transform of this whole expression. So we can use the final value theorem and write that little y at infinity is the limit of s times capital Y of s as s approaches zero, which will be basically this whole expression without s 
because as we multiply s by ys this s will cancel out and then we have to take the limit of this new rational function as s approaches zero so this term in the numerator will be zero and this term in the denominator will be zero so we will have 2 over 4 or 0.5 in the same manner we can calculate the initial value or the value of little y at time zero as limit of s times ys as s approaches infinity we will be basically the limit of the same expression but this time as s approaches infinity which will be 5 over 5 or 1 and the last property that i'm gonna talk about is time delay it basically says that if we have a laplace transform of a function capital y s and this is equal to e to the power of minus s times theta times a new function capital f of s where capital f of s itself is a laplace transform of a little f of t and theta is a constant which we call it time delay and i'll shortly explain to you why we call this time delay now if i want to take the inverse laplace transform of capital y s and find little y t i can use the time delay property and right away find that little y t is equal to f which is this function but this time at t minus theta times h at t minus theta and this second function or this second term is basically a step function or heavy side function and i taught you this in the past so just to remind you a step function of t minus theta so now the argument of the function is t minus theta will be zero when argument is less than zero and will be one whenever the argument is larger than or equal to zero so just to again help you understand this part better let's plot the two functions uh, a small f of t and a small y of t so if a small f of t is a function like this the a small y of t which is this function will be zero as long as t is smaller than theta so that's why you see as long as t is smaller than theta this function is zero and as long as t is larger than or equal to theta it will be one times f of t minus theta which is basically a translation of this function by theta in time so that's why i think now the reason that we call this time delay is clear so yt is just a translated version of ft in time by just theta okay now that we know most of the properties of laplace transform let me give you one more example in here many of you asked me about pulse function and impulse function that we went through in the last session so in this example i'm going to show you how we take these functions into practice and as you know i like to keep the example simple so we don't get involved in driving the governing equation instead we can emphasize on the solution of equation and the analysis of the system so for the same reason let's get back to our linear search tank i'll just quickly draw the sketch of the search tank here so there is one inlet flow rate which is qi and there is an outlet flow rate which is q and the level of liquid within the search tank is h so let's say at time zero this level is h zero and i just quickly rewrite the assumptions that we had in here the first assumption was rho is constant and because here i don't want to solve this parametrically i'm just going to give it a value let's assume that the liquid is water so the rho is 1000 kilogram per meter cube secondly the area of the tank is constant and we can assume that 
In this case, the area of the tank is 2 meter square. Third, we assume that the flow rate at the outlet is proportional to the elevation of liquid within the tank and we hypothesize that that uh, proportion is 1 over R and R is basically some sort of hypothesized resistance so here I'm just going to give it the value of 1 and if you work out the unit you'll see that the unit of R will be minute per meter square the other assumption was QI is constant, but here I'm just going to change that assumption. So QI is not constant anymore. Instead, QI is a function of time, and we will get to this shortly. And the fifth assumption is the system is at its steady state at time zero. So in other words, at time zero, the elevation of liquid within the tank is at its steady state and let's give it the value of one meter so i can just write in here that h at time zero is a steady state and it's one meter now in terms of assumption number four we used to assume that the flow rate into the tank is constant and because of the same reason, the only transient condition that we had was as if we were looking at the startup of the system, for example, where we are just filling up the tank and the elevation inside the tank was initially subject to change. But in this case, we can assume that there is a flow meter and there is a flow control valve upstream the system and we have an operator in the control room and she's monitoring the flow of the liquid into the tank and all of a sudden she realizes that at time zero the flow control valve has a malfunction and suddenly releases a large amount of liquid into the system and at a very short period of time but then it gets back to its normal operation and the flow rate returns to its normal operating condition so what she observes is that during normal operating condition the flow rate to the system was one cubic meter per minute and then at time zero there is a huge spike in the flow rate but at a very short period of time and then it quickly gets back to its normal value of one meter cube per minute now she does some investigation and realizes that the amount of liquid that was transferred to the tank within this very short period of time which i show it as from zero to tw was 1.25 meter cube now she wants to study the effect of sudden change in qi on q for that, she comes up with this interesting idea that she can split this input function or QI into two functions. The first function is called QI bar and that is basically representative of the normal operating of the system. And for that, we know that at normal operating, the flow rate into the tank is one meter cube per minute so what happens is the second function which i call it qi prime and that's basically the disturbances on top of the normal operating condition can be obtained simply by subtracting qi bar from qi and what we get is basically this hatch impulse function so in order to properly define our qi prime we need to know the area of the hatched rectangle and for that we need to subtract the total area which was 1.25 minus the area that is under our normal operating curve i'll try to show that with red hatch but as i mentioned this time t 
PW is very small. So technically the red portion can be neglected and we can just simply say that our disturbance is an impulse function with a total area of 1.25 meter cube. And again, I emphasize that this is an impulse function. So it means that the duration of it is very short. But just for the simplicity, I showed it like this tall and narrow rectangle. Now that we split QI into QI bar and QI prime, we can write the mathematical representation of that as QI, which is a function of time now is equal to qi bar plus qi prime and the normal operating condition was one meter cube per minute of flow into the tank plus qi prime was an impulse function with a magnitude of 1.25 so i can write it as 1.25 times delta of t and delta of t, I just remind you, was unit impulse or Dirac delta function. So with that, I think we have all the input parameters and assumptions to solve this example. Now the first thing I would need to do is to write the governing equation. And I just simply write it down. You can find how we obtained this equation in the previous lecture. A dh dt plus 1 over r times h is equal to qi which is now a function of time and now i can uh, put the values of the parameters in here so a is 2 r is 1 and qi is 1 plus 1.25 times delta of t and just to follow our normal procedure at this point i have to take the laplace transform of this whole equation which gives me two and i just directly write the outcome of the laplace transform times capital s times capital h of s minus h at time zero plus capital H of S is equal to Laplace transform of 1 is 1 over S plus 1.25 and we know that Laplace transform of Dirac delta is 1. So at this point I can just factor capital H of S and rearrange the equation to obtain and that gives me hs is equal to and again at this stage i can take the inverse laplace transform of capital hs and luckily i could find expressions for each of these two functions on the right hand side so little h of t becomes the first rational function is a match to item number 13 in our Laplace transform table and its invert Laplace transform becomes 1 minus e to the power of minus t over 2 and then the second term is a match to item number 6 in the table and its invert Laplace transform is 3.25 times 1 over 2 e to the power of minus t over 2 so if i just simplify that ht becomes and now i can even make it simpler and write ht is equal to 1 plus 0 0.625 times e to the power of minus t over 2 and this is the transient response of the system to the impulse function so if i plot this I will get the dashed line curve in this plot and as you can see at time zero 
there is an instantaneous increase in the level of liquid within the tank from its normal operating condition of 1 meter so I show this as HSS to its maximum which is 1.625 and then it takes about 10 minutes for the level of liquid within the tank to get back to its normal operating condition and what is the solid line the solid line is basically the response of the system to a rectangular pulse function of this shape and this is basically an equivalent amount of excessive liquid that we are adding to the tank but this time instead of doing it instantaneously we are doing it over a period of a quarter of a minute and just to make sure that this is equivalent to our impulse uh, function the excessive amount of liquid is the area of this rectangle and it's from 1 to 6 or 5 so 5 meter cube per minute times the duration is 0 0.25 minute it's exactly 1.25 meter cube so I suggest that uh, as an exercise you calculate the response of the system to this function.